Good morning, families from Encounter Love and Friendship Church. It is my hope that even though this difficult time, you still are having a good time. It all depends on the way we see things with the eyes of whether this is a problem or look at the situations that come into our life as lessons that God wants to give us which is re in reality how the Bible teaches us so that we can continue on. I miss you guys. That is definite. I miss you and I pray for you. It is my hope that Christ is being formed to you, in you through this quarantine time. I also want to remind you that we continue in this time of isolation, praying and fasting, asking and praying for the authorities that God gives them wisdom and all the decisions that need to be taken. And also praying and interceding for those who don't know about Christ, that they are seeing the situation as something of desperation. And for those who have lost loved ones and those who are in the battlegrounds, uh, um, the doctors, the nurses, and all of those uh, necessary workers that are in the hospitals and clinics and other areas. There's so much to pray for, so much to intercede. And I want to encourage you to continue to pray and fasting one day of the week, whatever day you decide. In some occasions, I've told you a little bit about the fasting. The objective is to ask the Lord who sees our priorities that we can show him that we are going to be hurting for the pain of others and also asking the Lord for the petitions that you have, your personal ones and also family ones. I also want to remind you of that, I'll let you know, as you saw in the announcements, that this past Thursday, which was the Day of the Children, we will hold it on another occasion as soon as we're able to get together again. And, well... And this morning, I want to share with you about the fourth part of this series that I've been sharing with you. You will get through this. And the title is precisely because this quarantine time, it has been a difficult time. And the promises of God that we will get through this situation. God is a faithful God. He is a God that's wise. And he tells us in Jeremiah 29, 11, that he knows the plans he has for us. So in particularly, this Sunday, I want to speak to you about this fourth lesson that the prophet Daniel gives us. Last week, I spoke to you about why of the difficult times, why God shakes our world in occasions. And well... One of the points that was very clear to me, obviously in order for me to share it with you, I need to learn it first, that it shouldn't surprise us. The difficult time is going to come. God is going to shake us with the five purposes that I shared you know, a few weeks ago. And it's you should not see this world as heaven or paradise. It can be lots of blessing to live in this world because Christ is in my heart, but it's not paradise and it, there's a big difference. Unconsciously, I am desiring that this world be the paradise and when difficult times come, then I am surprised. And then it takes me, the spiritual battle that I get into takes me by surprise. Satan is not going to lose any opportunity to, to try to get me out of the gospel, the way of the Lord. Let us go into this fourth part of the series that I've titled, When You Are Pressured by This World. When You Are Pressured by This World. As I mentioned, tribulations, difficult times, one of the things that it's going to reveal to us is what is in our heart. And in the questions of uh, like metaphors or oh, what's, and also, oh, actually metal, the signs of the metal, different metals when they're extracted from mines, how they're clean of all impurities through fire, 
And in Proverbs, it is mentioned to us, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3. In the New Living Translation, it says, Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Wow. So we don't like to be tested, but just as silver and gold in order to be separate from the impurities of what is actually the pure metal, it needs to be tested by fire. And this reveals the impurities. In the same way, God is going to have us go through fire. And for this, the world system, the society is going to be used. And let me mention to you, it's a double purpose. In one side, when difficult situations come, I had explained to you that one is a temptation. It's a situation designed by Satan to have you um, separate from God. And test is designed by God to come closer to him. But when we go through tests, Satan doesn't just cross his arms. He's going to take advantage of this difficult time that God designed to help you draw closer to God. Satan is going to try to actually have you be discouraged, you know, give up, get mad at God so that you make a pity party and well, because he wants to deviate you from God. That's what Satan's going to look in. Even if the original purpose of God, his perfect will is at the challenging time is to show you the impurities that are in our hearts, just like we read in Proverbs. So th having that in account, society is going to be an instrument that Satan utilizes. So they're going to be people who are going to pressure you, people who are going to encourage you. And well, in the beginning of this series, I explained to you that we're going to utilize the example of Daniel the prophet. And he's a young man that he is brought, he's deported from his homeland when the people of Israel is taken captive to Babylon. He is one of the young men that is taken and theologians think and they calculate that he was probably around 15 years old. Daniel, in difference of other people in the Bible, uh, we're not told much about his family. I'm not going to know much about his parents, his uncles, or any family members. So he is taken cap in captivity to Babylon. But in Babylon, he behaves in an exemplary way. He serves in the court of the king as a counselor and advisor, and he continues to move up the ladder. And I want to encourage you to read the book of Daniel. He's promoted on seven different occasions, different positions. But every time one of these promotions is going to come, he goes through a difficult time, a time where he was pressured, he was anguished, he was submitted to pressure. Just as we read in Proverbs, he was submitted or tested by fire. And he came out triumphant. So there's so much to learn from Daniel. Amongst it, he serves the king. He serves two kings from the Babylonian Empire. One of them was Nebuchadnezzar. And the evangelist, uh, that through his testimony of Daniel, he is he's an example. So when there's difficult time, kings would always go to Daniel because they knew that he had something different because of his character and his behavior. So Daniel is utilized as an advisor of two emperors in Babylon, but also when that empire leaves the Persian empire conquests the Babylonian empire, but he is still respected because of his trajectory and now that he's even an elder and he has basically stopped, you know, in he's in retirement. So now then the Persian emperor brings Daniel to, to get out of his retirement to come and work with him. So he 
actually serves in two different empires then. So Daniel leaves us a tremendous example. So let us go with point number one. Today I'm going to talk to you about three points. The first one's going to be, before a blessing, there is a tribulation. Before a blessing, there's going to be a tribulation. The second point, before the blessing, there's pressure for perdition. I will enter into more details. And then I'm also going to talk to you about two qualities. In reality, there's four qualities, but I'm only going to touch up on two qualities that Daniel teaches us. And if God gives us life next Sunday, I will share the other two qualities that the prophet Daniel teaches us so that we can get through this difficult time. So let us enter in reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. And the first point, before a blessing, there is a tribulation. And 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. So here... I mentioned this Bible verse because I need to have very present that in order for me to maintain in the tribulation with success to remain, I need to live by the approval of only one person, and that person is God. I am reading that it's Paul here telling us these words that he presented himself as a messenger someone who brought the message from God, but he owes himself to God. Let's read again. For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with good news. Another way to say good news is the gospel. Gospel means good news. In this case, the Apostle Paul, he's there sleeping, waiting for the coming of Christ. But now it's us that has we have been entrusted with the good news the gospel. Our purpose is to please God, not people. So this is the first thing I need to have present when I am in the midst of tribulation. In tribulation, if I go through it with success, blessings going to come. But before that, I need to maintain myself pleasing God, the audience of one person. In other ways, I've heard In various places, God has a plan, a perfect plan, and that's true for you. The question is that everybody else around you has a plan for my life, whether it's my parents, my siblings, my wife, my husband, my children. Everybody has an opinion of how I should live my life. So if I'm going to want to live my life wanting to please my children or the neighbor or my boss, please whoever, anybody else, I'm going to get out of the will of God. The only person that is enough wise, that is wise enough, it's not even myself, it's God. He is the only person who is wise enough to direct my life. Matter of fact, he left plans before I was born and he designed them and said, yes, I have the plans for the life of Joel, even though he's not here yet. In other occasions, maybe for my parents, I was a surprise or you were a surprise for your parents, but for God, you weren't. God already had your name. He had you planned. And there are two wills so I can understand it. There's a plan of God that obviously God is perfect. So that's why we're going to call it the perfect will of God. And anyhow, because God gave us free will. It's one of the gifts from God. We have our will. We're going to call it the permissible will of God. So there's the perfect will of God and the permissible will of God. So the permissible one is when I leave God's plan, according to Romans 8.28, that everything works well for those who love his name. God can transform uh, error, a mistake of mine into a blessing. But first of all, there needs to be repentance and an unnecessary pain that God in his perfect will 
did not had not designed for our life for me to go through i don't know through an assault or an illness or a divorce or a economic crisis god didn't design it but my stubbornness has me go through that that it's god's permissible will it's a gift he permits me to go through there because i wanted to not because god had designed it so under pressure i need to understand that i need to come closer to god to listen to his voice and not pay attention to all the other voices god's voice should be the most present in my life and then we're going to see how daniel did this as i mentioned before satan is not going to stay still he is going to try to confuse me make make that the tribulation be stronger for me to lose the blessing let us see the example in daniel for all the series we are taking account the book of daniel in daniel chapter 1 verse 7 we see how the chief of staff renamed them with these babylonian names daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. And here we had read it last week, but I had not shared the meanings of the names. Daniel, what means is God is my judge. When they want to change his name to Belshazzar, Belshazzar means Baal protects me. Baal was the idol in babylon so they're trying to change his name from nebuchadnezzar wanted to change his name from hananiah is also changed his name to shadrach and a babylonian name michelle had a different meaning Re- means god has helped me which is a testimony. They change his name and his name. So let's look back at Ananias' name. His name means God is merciful. And his name is changed to Sadrach. Sadrach was the god of the moon of Babylon's. Michel meant who is like God. His name was a question as Yahweh, Jehovah. Michel meant who is like God. And his name is changed to Mesek, which was the God of fertility. And Azariah, which meant God has helped me. Every time he mentioned his name was a testimony. God has helped me. And his name now meant servant Benego which was another god of the Babylonians. So the fact that their names were being changed, they want to change their identity. We see in the Bible that your name has a lot to do with your character. And your name and your character has to do a lot with your identity in which you were born. What is the perfect plan that God designed you for? In the present, we seek for the weirdest names so they can be more original so that nobody's name is like yours but in the bible names had to do with the purpose for which god made you be born and so that is why god before jesus was born the name is revealed to maria also in the case of elizabeth the mom of john the baptist and you can see clearly how society says that zechariah says what do you mean his name is going to be named John? He, his name needs to be like Zechariah, the father. And then is when Zechariah writes that his name will be John. And that's when he is able to talk again. If you haven't read this story, I invite you to read it in the Gospel of Luke in the beginning. But what I want to get to is that here, between Daniel and his friends, they are being pressured by the king Nebuchadnezzar so that they may change their identity and the reason why the reason why God made them be born so if I am waiting to go through a difficult time and have the victory I need to be very conscious first of all why was I born what's my purpose and define it and if 
at this time in my life, you still don't know why God created you, what his perfect plan for you. We have class 301. In class 301, you can discover what talents and purposes that your life has because your mission in the world it goes hand in hand with the tools that God has given you. If God created you to speak and to give his message in public, God is going to give you that talent to be able to transmit his message. If God created you, we see in the Old Testament that there was to build the tabernacle. There were those who had the gift from God to work with gold and silver. And God calls them and gives them the design of what they need to do in gold and and silver to be able to build the tabernacle. God has given us hundreds of talents, each and every one of us. You have some that maybe send out, but you cannot say, oh, God just gave me one talent. No, God gave us all talents. So then I need to have an account that Satan, through tribulation, is going to want to take your identity, that talent, that purpose for which God made you be born. And here's where if you didn't listen to the sermon from Thursday, I invite you to listen to it where it talks. I talk about the nature, the spiritual nature, and our human nature. If I begin to read the word and my spiritual nature is strengthened, then I'm going to see all these talents that I have for the Lord. But if I feed my human nature, then I'm not going to behave like God. And in other parts of the Bible, they call the sinful nature as like an animal nature. I can behave like an animal where an animal just worries about eating, uh, sleeping, and reproducing, just basic necessities. And so I have never seen a cow or a dog to praise the Lord be, you know, before they begin eating because all they think about is themselves and because that's what their nature allows them to do. So Satan's going to want to reduce us to the animal nature, to only think about me, me, me. And when I come to the Lord, I begin to see the big picture, and I can see I am part of the body of Christ. And even if my purpose and the intention for which you made me be born, I didn't understand, now I understand it. And I am a part of your plan, of your beautiful plan, to be part of a congregation, a family that's going to live beyond eternity. But well, let us go to point number two. I spoke to you about point number one. Before a blessing, there is a tribulation. Before a blessing, there is a tribulation. Number two, before the blessing, there is pressure for perdition. Before the blessing, there is pressure for perdition. What do I mean by this? Let us read Daniel chapter 1 and verse 5. And then I'm going to jump to verse 8. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years and they would enter the royal service. Anyhow, Daniel had decided not to contaminate himself with the food and wine of the king and he asked permission to the steward to not eat of those unacceptable foods. And I want to focus on this part that Daniel had decided not to, not to contaminate his body with the food and the wine given by the king. So why do I don't make emphasis on this? Because in order for a teenager who's about 15 years old let us try to remember. Some of us are going to have a harder time remembering, you know, when we were 15 years old. Maybe decades have gone by. But how did you act when you were 15? What were your desires of your heart when you were 15? Imagine you are now in Daniel's shoes. He is serving. It's not a president. Nebuchadnezzar was an emperor. The difference is an emperor didn't have limits from his desires. What he wanted to do needed to be given at the moment. And an emperor is kind of an imitation of God. What he said, whether he wanted someone to die, he would give the order and that person would die. 
that person would be executed. A president, you know, they're giving limits. But here with Nebuchadnezzar, he is told, you're going to be in a training. And because you're going to be trained, you can ask whatever you want to eat. And I imagine if if one of these teens could have asked for something else, they could have been given either power, sex, material things, whatever they wanted. Anyhow, here's why I underlined it. It says that Daniel proposed he would, had decided, he had decided not to contaminate himself with the food and wine given by the king. So then this of food and wine, it's a symbol that Daniel is making the decision to not allow himself to be pressured to fall into perdition. So many examples there are in society in which young men and women who have talents for sports, that they give them money, and next thing you know, they're perverted. And years later, they have to get kicked out of the football team, or they're in uh, rehabilitation centers because they're, you know, drinking or alcohol, alcohol or drug issues. So Satan is going to want to uh, force pressure so that you can fall in per- to perdition. Satan's going to pressure us to fall into perdition. So Daniel's giving us an example that he decided, I need to make that decision before the test comes to not contaminate myself. Here, I want to re- refer to the young youth. I know maybe right now they are in their class. I invite you to show this this part of the sermon as a young person. And adults, talk to your teenager. As a young man or woman, you're going to seek to decide whether you're going to maintain yourself a virgin before marriage to to become be a virgin for marriage if you're going to decide while you're already in a relationship when you're already kissing it's too late it's important as a parent to instruct our teenagers since they're children to decide ahead of time that they're going to maintain pure it's not a secret every generation of persons in this planet they're more and more liberal and they're going to transmit values that are more contrary to the bible through school through movies through i am surprised how in netflix there are not movie that you see where it doesn't have messages of homosexuals or sexual content nothing to do with the movie but they show it to you show it to you even in in cartoons and make it seem as something normal i have nothing against those folks who decide that homosexual lifestyle it's the same as a thief or the person who gossips or the person who wants to take revenge it is decisions that are contrary to what the bible says and as i mentioned there's god's perfect will and then there's this permissive will so it's to tell our youth this is god's perfect will and this is God's permissible will. This is going, you can do it, but this can bring you suffering. It could even cause you your eternal life if you don't choose to go back to the way of the Lord. There's no blessing if when there's pressure, I fall into perdition. So the majority of the youth decide how they're going to spend the rest of their life in that period between teenagehood up to 22, 23 years. That's why Proverbs says, you do not be strong-willed, don't be stubborn. This is the time of life where you have freedom, you have strength, but you have an ingredient that you lack, that it is the lack of wisdom. So we need to seek with this example of Daniel to transmit to our teenagers and young adults, decide not to contaminate yourself In this case, it's with food and wine of the king. We're going to take it beyond the lifestyle of our society. Um, To make a little parenthesis here in respect to food, the people of Israel in the Old Testament was chosen as the people that 
was going to reveal to us the secrets from the Lord. That is why God chose Abraham and from his descendants, the people of Israel came out because God was a chosen people. But the objective was that the people of Israel would show the lifestyle that God had chosen for them to share with the rest of the world. So God gives them the Ten Commandments and different books of the Bible. And that is why Jesus was born through, you know, the people of Israel as an Israelite. So many things have been given to us through the people of Israel because God chose them so that they could model to us the lifestyle that God wanted for everybody else. This is a symbol of now how God has chosen us now. So God gave us the Great Commission. But in the Old Testament, God had given them specific foods, what they could eat and what could not eat as an example that later on was going to be symbolized as a lifestyle that we need to now have spiritually. But it was food that God made. It's not dirty in itself. For this, let me hear clarifying this point. Let us see 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 to 5. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be in with thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. So he was talking about the false prophets that were going to be rising up and teaching. So here we're seeing that it's eating something created by God, even if it's not something that was in the law is not bad in itself it was a symbolism that god was leaving for the people of israel nowadays there's a lot of things that that were created in in nature to contaminate myself now there's junk food where i need to take care of the temple of of god it is here from the book of daniel that daniel plan comes out that we have studied years behind in the past how to eat healthy with the foods that god created just to finish clarifying that there's nothing wrong with what god creates from the animals and the plants fruits and vegetables that we should eat jesus himself in matthew 15 11 leaves it very clear it is not what goes into your mouth that defiles you You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. So we're seeing here that Daniel proposes not to contaminate himself as a symbolism that he proposed in his heart to be a part in order just to do the will of God. So God gives this special diet to the people of Israel as a symbolism spiritually now from what the world wants to contaminate us but it's also being a spiritual attack from satan because satan what he wants is to to steal your identity and your purpose not only with food but with sex with power that they may serve themselves so here we're going to read ezekiel chapter 11 verse 12 where it says And you will know I am the Lord, for you have refused to obey my decrees and regulations. Instead, you have copied the standards of the nations around you. Here is God, very upset with the people of Israel, saying to the people of Israel, just as eating, there are many other customs that they did not obey, and they were just like the rest of the nations around them. They copied their standards. God is telling the people of Israel, what I designed you for, what I chose you for, what I revealed the the Ten Commandments for, you are not fulfilling it. And it's sad to say this, but, you know, they failed with the plan that God had designed. And this did not surprise God, but the equivalent of this is that we are now, we're given the Great Commission, and how sad it would be that God would tell us, you did not fulfill with the Great Commission. You did not share with the perfect plan that I gave you to fulfill. We know that. And the book of Revelations, it tells us at the end of times, the Great Commission is going to be fulfilled. The question is, if you and I 
would have been a part, you know, with our grain of salt, would we have fulfilled with the perfect will of God that in which he has designed us? Or are we going to succumb to the pressure of perdition to serve ourselves? Are we going to succumb to being selfish? Because we can be sons and daughters of God, but have a selfish way of thinking. And we need to seek to mature and say, God, I want to begin to, through this difficult time, realize that my prayers are only me, me, me. God bless me. God give me. God take away from me. And I need to begin to think of others. I need to begin to ask the Lord direct me so I can be a blessing to those who surround me and not only being centered in me. Jesus Christ modeled it for us. Everyone, everything he came to do here on earth was thinking of us. He didn't even get married. He didn't have children. He didn't have a home or, you know, the camel of the year or the American dream that we're always investing our whole life to get. Jesus Christ is the perfect model. And he did not succumb to pressure of perdition. And what Satan offers the kingdoms of the whole world, Jesus says, no, it is written, the Lord God, you will serve and only him you will worship. So he shows us that the temptation is going to be surpassed when we center ourselves in the will of God. From here then, I want to share with you two of the four qualities that we can learn from Daniel. Daniel teaches us. The first one is integrity. Integrity. It, Daniel, we can see there in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, Daniel was determined not to get contaminated. So he didn't want, Daniel never forgets his identity. He had decided not to get contaminated. Daniel never forgets his identity. Daniel decided not to get contaminated. And that is a reflection of that determination that he had, that he said, I am not going to be the same as the rest of society. And even if I look old-fashioned, um, antiquated, I'm going to do the will of God. And this goes, we can see in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where he needed to change his way of thinking. It says, the word of God in the New Living Translation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So that change, a way of thinking that we are seeing here, renewing our mind, there we need to begin. That even though everyone does it, I'm going to remain with integrity. And the definition of integrity is someone who behaves the same way without mattering where they are or who they're with. What am I referring to? That person is honest no matter if there's a lot of people or they're alone. That person is going to have the same character when they're alone as to when they're with lots of people. They're going to make the same decision as to when they're alone. The word hypocrite, because it sounds harsh, but the word hypocrite comes from the word in Greek that was used to act for actors of theater back then in the time of the Greek. It, there were men who were allowed to be actors, not women. And so in occasions, one actor did all of the characters, all the characters of the theater. So they would use a mask and that mask is the de definition of hypocrite. So a person who used different masks depending on the character that they were acting out. So they would get dressed as a woman or a man, 
uh, elderly man or a little boy. So they would change their character by changing the mask. And that's where the word hypocrite comes out. Someone, depending on who they're with, they're going to change their mask in a way they act. So it is contrary to someone who has integrity. The person who has integrity is the same as someone who's at church, is the same with their friends, with their family, or they're alone at home. So we need to seek to learn from Daniel. Let us get into this more. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, where it talks about the temple of the living God. It says here, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be partnered with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? How tremendous this is. God is speaking to us that friendship with some people, especially here, what relationship intimate relationship and it compares to who are my friends that I'm going to get my values. I can hang out with someone because of work or school, but who are my actual intimate friends? Those friends are folks that have similar values, that have similar ways of thinking. If in particular, I don't like to um, use bad words, then very difficultly am I going to have a relationship, intimate relationship, you know, um, with someone if, if I'm someone who says a lot of bad words all the times. But I want to specify, when you are sharing the gospel with someone, it's not an intimate relationship. But in order for that person to become an intimate friend, they need to re- receive Jesus Christ if they have not received them. Other ways, I've known people who they say that they're very spiritual, but their friends, their intimate friends are people who lie, people who like to cheat, people with money, um, have no integrity. So we say this person is like those Greek actors that are called hypocrites. Yeah, before they're with an audience, they put a mask, but when they're, you see them with the friends they actually hang out with, it's people who lie, who are who have just really bad character flaws. Those are the values. But because they were in a mask, apparently they are a Christian person and of values. But when they're with their intimate friends, you can see that the intimate friends don't have biblical values. And that's because this person doesn't have them either. They're saying, what friendship can there exist there, right? So Daniel the prophet, even though he's serving the king, Daniel does not do what Nebuchadnezzar told him to do. He maintained with his intimate friends that these friends that were mentioned with him from Jerusalem, and he maintains with them being a man, a young man of integrity, praying three times a day. A day. We're going to see it later, and praying only to God, even though a big statue is built for Baal, and they're told that they need to bow down and pray. And Daniel says, no, I will not be contaminated. But let me finish with the second point of the four points we're going to be seeing in the future. But for this Sunday, it's just two. And this is discipline. Daniel controlled his appetite and his selfishness. Daniel controlled his appetite and his selfishness. So he remained disciplined. And this speaks of Romans 6.13. It says, Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. More clear, this verse could not be. All the members of my body, in the case of Daniel, it included his stomach. He's being invited to eat everything that the king ate. It could be now day in the present for my stomach. Well, I don't sin. How do you treat your body in this time of quarantine? Are you exercising or are you uh, mistreating the body God gave you? It seems something simple, like how I treat my body up to 
complex situations that are very hurtful like sexual immorality. When I cannot contain my sexual appetite, I hurt others, myself, my family, other people's family just for a sexual appetite that I do not control. So through Daniel, we can see these qualities and in this case, the discipline. I'm talking about integrity and discipline. So I need to learn how to say no to myself. No if it goes against the Bible. No if it's not in the time of God. And here I refer myself to the youth again. Discipline to say, no, I am not going to have sex until I get married. Oh, that's so old school. Well, I, do I live for the approval of one person, which is God, and God says that's how it needs to be, and so then I do it. I submit my will to God. I submit my personal appetite to what God tells me. That is discipline. That is integrity. That even though I want to do something because I'm living to to just please the Lord, and if God tells me no, then I am able to restrain myself. And the Word of God tells us that He gave us He gave us self dominion, and so I couldn't do it before God, but God Himself gave me spirit to you know it says it there in the book of timothy god has given you the power to love to be able to dominate yourself so there's no excuse god has given me all the instruments for me to be able to be someone who's disciplined it's going to be challenging yes but god has given us that power to dominate ourselves so i want to end with a prayer for you I desire that this quarantine time, you are getting A's, spiritual A's, 10s um, in in this test. Remember, the test is to reveal what's in your heart. And you're realizing that your heart is clean, pure, and character. That's wonderful. That is my desire as your pastor, as your spiritual trainer, to use a different term. My desire is that you are coming along but anyhow you can also find yourself saying wow there's many areas that i need to better they if i'm seeing that there's a lot of impurities in my heart that have come afloat in the midst of the test then if god allows us to live is because his mercy is new every day and he says repent change come to the good way i am here waiting for you with my arms open wide so god is here to accept you to help you and that also goes for people who maybe have not accepted jesus christ had not heard him had not understood it and maybe because they had not wanted to accept him yet and this morning i want to make a prayer for you i pray that you close your eyes and if you have not accepted jesus christ it's so simple just takes a minute the importance is the attitude of your heart that even if you don't repeat exact words that I say, that the intention of your heart may be to tell God, God, forgive me because I have conducted myself in a, st- a stubborn way. I've made mistakes, which you call sins. And I ask that you forgive me. I repent. And I also want to accept your terms. I want to accept your will. And I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior to not do my own will, but to do your will. The Word of God says that if you have made this prayer of this type using your own words, but you have confessed that you want to accept Jesus Christ, that you repent, you recognize Him, that He is the Lord, and the Word says that you are now part of the spiritual family. Now I want to refer to all of those who maybe are part of the spiritual family, but they realize that they are maybe falling short that we find ourselves with issues of integrity or lack of discipline in this hour god is here to help us to behave in a way the way that needs to be of a son and daughter of god i want to pray for you father i give you many things knowing that you want to give us a new opportunity it is why you tell us that your mercies are new every morning In this hour, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters who are seeing this sermon. I pray that you help them, Lord, with that spirit of love, power, and self-dominion. That you help us, Lord, 
to make those decisions, to do your perfect will, to please you, Lord. Stop pleasing ourselves. Stop living for ourselves. Stop conducting ourselves in our own definitions, values, and advice, Lord. We want to not do my will, but I want to do your will. You reveal in your word that if I am wrong, I want to be sufficiently humble to accept my error and ask you to come and help me and conduct me. I want to be docile. I want to be with a heart that listens to you just like the gold that's put through fire. I invite you to shape my heart, Lord, and that you also help me not to do what society pressures me to do. Father, thank you for this difficult time. Thank you for the example of Daniel the prophet. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy in this hour. We give you thanks for all of your blessings, and we dispose ourselves to um, say goodbye from this transmission, Father, but not from your presence. Continue with us, Lord. I pray for all of those who are maybe going through a difficult time, that these numbers, Lord, uh, that if we need a word of prayer, that them, their children, Lord, I put those who are part of Encuentro de Moria Amistad, that you bless them, Lord, in the day of tribulation. And I pray, Lord, that you continue to give us a spirit of power, love, and self-dominions. In Jesus' name, I give you thanks. I say goodbye, families of Encounter Love and Friendship Church, and we'll see each other on Thursdays and also in the devotionals. God bless you.